Welcome to this edition of Theological Journals on the 1.30 p.m. on the 24th of June. We're in Hedgehog Review with some notes by the editor on this edition, which is dedicated to uses and abuses of history. For Lukacs, the study of history went astray, not by pessimism, but through various forms of neo-positivism that treat the past as something objectively knowable. As he put it, historical memory involves understanding beyond accuracy. It is a preoccupation with problems rather than peer- with periods, an exploration in depth, depth rather than its width, a constant rethinking of the past involving qualities rather than capacities of memory. But as Lucas knew, the research for a usable past was also likely to reduce or cheapen human experience. The very purpose of historical knowledge is a certain kind of understanding, he wrote, insisting that at its best it was contemplation of human perception. Since many of us today find ourselves disconnected from places, people, and cultural memory that give context and meaning to human life, we look to history to find out what is missing and who imagine what to do. We even call upon history to be the judge and final arbiter of our times and ourselves. Our greatest conflicts when the legitimacy of the liberal international order and the sustainability of capitalism to the meaning of family and national self-understanding are litigated through the histories of class, politics, gender, and state. It's no accident that on the eve of the invasion in February of this year, Vladimir Putin gave a late night speech that rewrote the history of the modern state of Ukraine. History matters. Putin understands that. If history has its uses as the thematic issues, essays in this issue variously demonstrate, then its abuses are manifold and not just among the Putins of the world. The abuses are most evident when history is used for the purpose of shoring up the position of the powerful or playing ally to activists, technocrats, advertisers, or ideologues who've grown accustomed to cheapening human experience. When history is pursued on such evidently instrumentalist terms, instead of under the humanistic auspices of seeking wisdom and understanding, and yes, a usable past, then something vital is lost. The entire edition is dedicated to studying historiography. Anglican Journal. The parish priest Poole helped build two new churches and launch education, outreach, and pastoral programs. He served as bishop for the York Credit Valley in the Diocese of Toronto from 2005 until his retirement in 2015. He described himself as stunned and humbled upon hearing that he'd received the cross of St. Augustine to be given an award of this statue for doing something I love really seems unnecessary. There are so others, many involved in my work who do much more. I'm of course thrilled and very grateful. Lawson received the Langton Award for Community Service for outstanding lay leadership at every level of Anglican life and nonprofit community service. She has served at the national level in the Anglican Church of Canada as a consultant and director of Department of Philanthropy, as well as various synods, uh, committees of synods. We now turn to Trinity Journal and the issue of the ancient Israelite calendar. 
based on the preponderance of linguistic evidence, is there any wonder that Sadducees, Samaritans, and Kerasites all believe that the Paschal lamb was to be slaughtered between the hours of 6 and 7 o'clock in the evening? The Pharisees, however, believed that lambs were to be slaughtered during the afternoon. Such a redefinition of Erev fails to give weight to the expression such as wolves of the evening. Later, temple-controlled practices are at variance with this understanding. The rabbis seeking to justify or explain afternoon performance of sacrifices originally designated for twilight were perhaps faced with the choice of either ignoring or redefining the temporal implications of the Hebrew in Exodus 16, 12, and 13. Instead of defining Bain Ha'aravim, the rabbis invented the phrase Bain Hashimashit, which does not occur in the Pentateuch. While many rabbis used both phrases to designate the transition period between day and night, Bain Ha Shemeshot signified between the suns, that is, the period between high noon and dark, from the time the sun leaves the eastern part of the sky and sinks to the west. This phrase would have suited well the six or seven hours required to slaughter tens of thousands of Pashkal lambs along with the evening sacrifice. Had the temporal limits of Bain Ha'aravim sufficed, it is doubtful the new expression would have come into use. However, it's unlikely that any phrase with Erev could have meant the afternoon due to its long-standing association with the sun's entry below the horizon, separating Passover and the first day of the unleavened bread. We turn to Anglican and Episcopal history, discussing in our first article Michael Ramsey and the 1968 Lambeth Conference. 33 subcommittees all producing their reports and filtering upwards to the plenary sessions. The 1968 Lambeth Conference, which had a lot of turmoil in the 60s, had its share of large events, but in comparison to the 1958 Lambeth, the number of engagements was small and deliberately so. Ramsey had hoped that the social program would be minimal and the bishops will have, if they wish, some quietness for their concentrated task. More generally, the recollections that survive tend to stress Ramsey's role in the setting of just such an atmosphere. His first biographer had the impression that what most impressed the bishops was the religiousness of the man. Eric Treacy, Bishop of Whitefield, was struck by just this during the day of recollection that Ramsey led before the formal business began. Simon Phipps, newly consecrated as suffragan Bishop of Horsham, had been impressed by the sight of Ramsey leading the bishops in the Wiene Kreat or Spiritus each morning. Russell, Russell Chandran, one of the observers from the Church of South India, similarly felt that the tone Ramsey had set in prayer and his evident humility had been crucial. To set and maintain such a tone under the circumstances was a significant achievement. Just as the Lambeth Conference began, the Vatican issued the Seismic Declaration on Contraception, Humanae Vitae, prompting a press conference given by Dean to the eager media. The conference had thus begun, in Ramsey's later words, to the press, and an atmosphere of sky a bit darkened. In mid-conference, 
the Soviet Union invaded Czechoslovakia again, 1968, tanks rolling down the streets. The fighting continued in Vietnam. In such circumstances, a kind of feverishness might have ensued. Oliver Tompkins, Bishop of Bristol, had detected a febrile atmosphere as the assembly of the World Council of Churches, which took place in Uppsala immediately before the bishops congregated in London. But the Lab Lambeth Conference was different, Tompkins thought. Not so urgent as Uppsala, but neither had it been so frenetic. This was, he thought, largely due to Michael Ramsey, his personality, his dislike of frenzy, his quiet daily guidance of the meditations, and his love of depth rather than width. I'm getting a picture of that archbishop, which is as commendable, as commendable. He was an academic by background. Our second article in the same journal is on Lambeth Conferences and International Relations, such as the Nation League of Nations, the Kellogg Pact, taking us up into the 1930s and 40s, and George Bell, Bishop of Chichester, I think, opposing the widespread bombing of German cities with civilians in it. International relations in the nuclear age, the Lambeth Conference of 1948. By 1948, it was apparent that the Sec Second World War had yielded a new confrontation between the East and West, and a world was divided by ideology. The Third Reich had come and gone. The Soviet Union had come to stay across Eastern Europe. The detonations by the United States of nuclear bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki marked the revolution in the science of modern warfare. The advent of the nuclear age saw a commissioning of reports across the churches in the United, the United States by the Federal Council of Churches, Atomic Warfare in the Christian Faith, 1946, and in Britain by the British Council of Churches and by the Archbishops of Canterbury and York at the request of the Church Assembly. The third report overseen by E.G. Selwyn represented an attempt to frame a distinctly Anglican view not only of nuclear weapons, but of war and peace at large. It was also notable for drawing explicitly on the thought of Grotius and seeking to establish precepts from biblical texts and natural law. Not everybody was convinced. In the church assembly, George Bell found that the report did not make due reference to Christ, that it lacked feeling even outrage, and that it missed the distinctly Christian note of compassion for suffering or forgiveness or charity. Now in the peacetime, the ecumenists achieved an impressive momentum. In 1948, the General Assembly of the World Council of Churches met in Amsterdam. It was natural for the Anglican bishops of 1948 to look hopefully to this and to greet the United Nations, just as the predecessors had welcomed the League of Nations, but their bland endorsement to the UN lacked the vivid conviction with which they embraced the League of Nations in 1920, nor were they roused to campaign with the same urgent idealism. <clears throat> the Cold War cast too long a shadow. Even so, the emerging covenant on human rights attracted particular attention. We'll resume that in our next edition. As we shift to a third article on church reviews, 
talking about the African Episcopal Church of St. Thomas, built in 1794. The visitor is struck by the feeling of diversity both in the congregation and liturgy. The service starts at 10 o'clock with a prelude by St. Thomas Music Ministry with at least 250 parishioners in attendance. The gospel choir is singing for this Sunday worship. The music is absolutely stunning, uplifting as the Spirit of God shines right through the singing. The choir of about 35 members and is accompanied by piano, organ, Congo drums, and snare drums. One thing that impressed this reviewer most during the service was the sense of global or world Christianity through music and lessons. All the readings of the lessons seemed to be read by someone of a different nationality, African countries as well as countries in the North American and Caribbean. The lessons were full of global diversity as well. The first reading for the day was Micah 6, 1 through 8. For the Lord has a controversy with the people, and he will contend with Israel. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt. O oh, my people, remember now what King Balak of Moab, the historical name for a mountainous strip of land in Jordan, devised. What Balaam, son of Baor, answered him. And what happened? from Shittim, an ancient city east of the Jordan River in Moab, to Gilgal. You may know the saving acts of the Lord. Clearly references in the biblical text to nations and cities in the Middle East highlighted world Christianity and the global reach of the Christian faith. Nice review. We turn now to table talk purity of heart Matthew 5 7 5 27 to 30 you have heard it was said you shall not commit adultery but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery in his heart Matthew Henry begins his commentary on today's passage with these words. We have an exposition of the seventh commandment given us by the same hand that made the law, therefore was fittest to be the interpreter of it. Henry's comments remind us that if we want the full understanding of the law of God, we cannot be content merely to look at the commandments but must look at how our Lord Jesus Christ interprets and applies them. After all, because he is the God of Israel who saved his people out of Egypt centuries before his incarnation, Jude 5, Jesus is the same God who revealed the Ten Commandments, therefore our, is our surest guide to their full meaning. As we see in Jesus' exposition of the seventh commandment recorded in Matthew 5, 27 to 30, the law against adultery was meant to apply, never meant to apply only to sexual relations between two unmarried people. This law, like other laws, also has broader implications for our hearts. Jesus tells us that the man who looks on a woman with lust has broken the seventh commandment, even if he never enters into a physical relationship with her. Of course, Jesus does not mean that a lustful look or desire alone is as bad as the physical act of adultery. There are no judicial punishments in the law for lustful desire. And sexual acts are far more serious in their immediate consequences than illicit acts. In addition to enjoining faithfulness in marriage in a physical sense, the seventh commandment calls us 
to stay away from lustful thoughts and desires and from anything that might incite our hearts and minds. As Christians must stay away from pornography and immodesty in general, being careful in what they look at, listen to, and think about. In our era of immodesty and sexual license, endeavoring to keep the seventh commandment will require us to think very carefully about the clothing we wear and the entertainment we consume. Sometimes our choices may require us to abstain from things in the ways the wider culture or even many professing Christians will consider strange. Better to be thought weird by the world, however, than to have lust consume us. The law against theft, Exodus 20, verse 8. Some of the most important aspects of life, including the purchase of property, inheritances, and so forth, involve financial matters. Thus, we are not surprised to find that God's law deals with such things as poverty, riches, and ownership in many places, Leviticus 25. As is the case with other matters central to human life, Ten Commandments provide the foundational law upon which other laws are related to financial and stewardship issues are based. We're talking about the Eighth Commandment, Thou shalt not steal, Exodus 20, 15. The commandment against theft is easy enough to understand. We should take care not to miss what the law assumes. In outlawing stealing, the Eighth Commandment assumes a right to ownership and private property. One cannot steal something if it does not rightly belong to someone else, so the Eighth Commandment implicitly commends the right acquisition and stewardship of material goods. Since God himself is an owner of the cattle on a thousand hills, we are made in his image. It makes good sense that there would be a way to mirror his ownership of all things through our ownership. In other words, God delegates to us the responsibility of owning and caring for property and other goods. He assigns human beings to be stewards of what ultimately belongs to him. As noted in the commandment, theft is easy enough to understand and human beings possess the innate sense of what that burglary is wrong. Yet we must remember that theft can occur in less blatant ways as well. John Calvin aptly comments on today's passage that not only are those thieves who secretly steal the property of others, but those who seek for gain from the loss of others accumulate wealth by unlawful practices and are devoted devoted to their private adva- more to their private advantage than to equity Calvin is not commending equity in the sense as it often appears today so he is not saying that the law prescribes an equal financial outcome for all. Economic systems such as socialism and communism are contrary to God's word. When the, what the reformer is getting at is that the commanded commandment against theft includes within it an approval of generosity that goes against our natural drive toward selfishness. Essentially, the law forbids us from advancing ourselves economically by taking advantage of the weaknesses of others. Bread upon the waters, Ecclesiastes 11, verse 1. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days give up portion to seven or even to eight for you know not what disaster may happen 
In the Eighth Commandment, we find the key law against theft that forms the basis for the other teaching in economics in Scripture by forbidding us from taking that which does not rightly belong to us, Exodus 20, 15. God's word implicitly commends private ownership and imposes on us the duty of wise stewardship so that we do not steal from others or even from our own future through mismanagement of what the Lord has given us. The commandment not to steal also applies helps us understand that it is good to try to build wealth and encourage others to do the same. Making theft illegal implies that one can never get so rich as to lose the right to keep what he rightfully owns. As long as we do not become selfish and advantage ourselves at the expense of others, there is no sin in seeking to increase our resources. The Bible only, not only implicitly approves of our seeking prosperity in the Eighth Commandment, but also features other passages that directly commend productive investment to gain wealth. Consider Ecclesiastes 11, 1 and 2, and it's called to cast our bread upon the waters. This exhortation likely draws from seafaring trade in the ancient world. An individual who financed the building of ships and travel by sea put his money at risk. It was always possible for the sailors not to discover the spices or other treasures they sought. Pirates could capture ships and their goods. Accidents and storms could sink the boats and expeditions that one invested in. In light of all this risk, the safe option would be to not cast your bread on the waters, to not invest in enterprise prizes that are not completely safe, but that promise extravagant returns. If scripture says not that we should forego investments, but rather that we should cast our bread upon the waters, spreading monies across diverse interests, seven or eight, in order to get a return. Certainly the Bible does not call us to reckless attempts at increasing wealth. Rather, it is calling us to put our resources to work wisely, that we may reap the benefit. In our day when we are tempted to spend everything now and not invest in the future, the Eighth Commandment's call to wise saving and investment needs to be heard and embraced. When we seek to multiply our resources, we create opportunities to enjoy more of the Lord's blessing and to have wealth to draw upon for the support of the church and to those truly in need living before God. Are you seeking to be a wise steward of your resources in order to preserve and increase them? This is what scripture commands. So if we are to be faithful to God and his law, we must seek as we are able to pursue the multiplication of resources that the Lord has given us. In so doing, let us have as our goal not merely to acquire more goods, but rather to increase our capacity to provide for the work of God's kingdom. We will pick that up in our next occasion as we turn to an editorial, Synod 2022, The Standard Bearer by Joshua Engelsma, pastor of Crete Protestant Reformed Church in Crete, Illinois. The Synod of the Protestant Reformed Churches in America met from July 14 to 17, 2022, in the facilities of Zion PRC, Jenison, Michigan. In addition to the 20 delegates representing classes East and classes West, and five professor advisors, there were two foreign delegates from our sister churches. As one present at the meeting, I'm glad to report that all proceedings were carried out in fine spirit. 
brotherly love and mutual trust, even when the delegates had differing views on certain issues. In this article, I will not attempt to review all the decisions taken by Synod. The daily news reports that were sent out the week of Synod referred to many of the decisions, and the interested reader can carefully read these through the Acts of Synod when it becomes available. Instead, I want to call attention to a few of the more significant matters addressed by our broadest assembly. The ministry of the gospel, one of the highlights of the synod's work was the examination of Mr. Marcus Wee. Mr. Wee is a member of Covenant Evangelical Reformed Church of Singapore, and this spring completed four years of training in our denominational seminary. At the request of his home congregation, he was examined by our synod. He preached a specimen sermon on Tuesday morning and was examined orally for most of Wednesday morning and Thursday morning. The brother demonstrated the natural and spiritual abilities necessary for the ministry. Accordingly, it took a decision to inform the Kirk that the Synod judged him worthy to be declared eligible for the call to the ministry of word and sacraments. The session of Kirk in Singapore will now decide whether or not to declare him a second turn the page, to declare him a call to him for their ministry or not to issue a call for him to serve as their pastor. Assume that that will go very well. And now for the June edition, still in that, on news from our churches by Mr. Charles Terpstra, Jenison, Michigan. On 24 June, Dune PRC sent a call to Reverend Smidstra after receiving pieces, PRC's call on April 27th. J. Marcus accepted it on May 1. On May 1, Pro Professor Gritters declined Grace Piercy's call. Subsequently, the call formed a new trio of Reverend Decker, Gutglar, and Langrick. On May 11, Hudsonville PRC called Reverend Smidstra from a trio that became a duo of Reverend Norman and Smidstra. Classes East met on May 11 at the New Redeemer Christian School location in Zeeland, Michigan. The agenda was lighter than in past years with one major item needing approval, Reverend Hawks emer emeritation. Seminary news. When the PRC seminary ended its semester on May 13, it marked the end of Prof. Dykstra's term as professor. For 26 years, he faithfully served the churches as professor of church history and New Testament studies. And now with Prof. Kuiper fully in place, Prof. Dykstra can retire as professor, that is. For last year, he accepted the call to Byron Center PRC and now serves full time in that capacity. We thank the Lord for his diligent labors in the seminary and pray that he may continue to be used for great good in the Byron Center congregation. In late April, the faculty announced Aaron Haverman entering his third year from Trinity PRC has been licensed to speak a word of edification in the churches. Two mission trips are planned for him, first to the Philippines and then to Mexico in late August. Senior Matt Kerner is also going on the mission trip to Mexico this summer prior to his internship in Randolph PRC. Missions and Evangelism. Pittsburgh PRC, didn't know the head one there, hosted her annual spring lecture on Friday. Reverend Marcus spoke on redeeming the time. Southeast PRC's evangelism committee asked 
the church members to join them in another door-to-door -door event on Saturday. As it was stated in the bulletin, this is a great way to increase awareness of our presence in the immediate community and to let others know the truth of the gospel. Wingham's P Wingham PRC's consistory has decided to start an evangelism committee for the purpose of organizing and facilitating their outreach as a church to the local community. According to the announcement in her bulletin, the committee is subject to the consistory and intended to be a servant of the congregation to help us as faithful witnesses of our Lord. Zion PRC, <coughs> PRC's mission committee held a short presentation about her role as the calling church on Sunday evening, May 8, which included question and answer period. They have a trio of reverends Brumel, Smidstra, and Spock, and Willis shall call on May 29. PRC news at the congregational level. As the saying goes, in the northern part of the country, there are two seasons, winter and construction. <laughs> With slight variation, the same holds true for church maintenance projects. With that in mind, Crete PRC had her parking lot paved in May. And I suspect there will be other construction projects in the churches this spring and summer. This is also the time of year when Sunday school classes begin for summer months. And I would love to have had my kids trained in their catechetical school. We were traveling around with the Navy and Marine Corps. These are solid Dutch Calvinists up in Grand Rapids. To mark their new season, first PRC Grand Rapids held a kickoff pizza dinner in the church basement. Hope PRC Grand Rapids, the congregation held her annual picnic on Saturday, May 7th at Hope PR Christian Schools. They have Christian schools, of course, for all their kids. So they're getting Bible and theology and catechism all the way through grade 12. The games began at 3 p.m. dinner afterward in the gym. From the weather we had that day, it seemed to be a great day for a picnic. Young people and young adult activities. The Linden Youth Program hosted a Memorial Day breakfast on May 30. I don't know about you, but I'm a big fan of these church breakfasts. Of course, the suppers are good too. And the ice cream socials never fail to satisfy. Well, I think you get the point. We'll pick that up again in our next edition. Turn to Bibliotheca Sacra for some wonky talk stuff from the Nativity and Epiphany of Jesus. And it's kind of wonky. He believes that Jesus' ministry began in AD 29 with the baptism shortly following thereafter, beginning in the fall. As I said, the 18th day after the temptation, but the first day after Jesus' encounter with John, when Andrew and the other others followed Jesus and stayed with him that day, was about the 10th hour. And when Andrew found his brother Simon and brought him to Jesus, and the gospel says, on the morrow, the Lord would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and saith unto him, follow me. As the sequence of the gospel indicates, this was the 19th day after the temptation and includes the call of Philip and Nathaniel. And then it says there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee on the third day after the two days I've mentioned which followed the encounter with John. Now, if the 20 days are added to the 40 days of the temptation, this makes for two months. And when these are combined with the 10 months that make up a year, or in other words, a full 30 years from the birth of our Lord, we find that Christ performed his first miracle 
the changing of the water into wine in John 2 at the end of his 30th year. As you must realize, if you follow the orders of events in the Gospels closely, there are a few differences between how Epiphanius accounts for this period between John's baptism, or Jesus' baptism, I should say, and the argument of this article. Epiphanius assigns 40 days to both the fast and temptation of Jesus, whereas in this proposed chronology, the period of temptation followed the fast. Luke says, and when they were ended, he afterward hungered, showing that Jesus' temptation to turn the bread's spread to stone and others followed the 40-day fast and was not part of it. Epiphanius causes Jesus to spend two weeks and two days in Nazareth on the strength of Luke 4, 14 to 30. But this incident is better viewed as belonging to a period later in Jesus' ministry, after he'd already begun to perform miracles in Capernaum. Epiphanius assigns only five days between Jesus' return, her birthday on January 6th, the date of the wedding at Cana, but following Irenaeus, the author of this article believes that Jesus would have turned 30 before making his first disciples. However, aside from these small differences, it seems certain that Jesus' nativity occurred in the early winter, but before Epiphany, and that his baptism had a fall date. Howard Honer is in accord. During the winter months, the sheep were brought in from the wilderness. The Lucan narrative states that the shepherds were around Bethlehem rather than the wilderness, thus indicating that the nativity was in the winter months. Although the exact date cannot be known, either December or January, that is most reasonable. These conclusions grow stronger as we proceed. We'll pick that up in our next occasion incidents. For now, Modern Reformation, the July-August edition, and we'll skip the poem and turn to the next article. When Tolerance Was No Ideal by Jonathan Koch. Who is Jonathan Koch? He a, has a PhD from Washington University, postdoctoral fellow at the California Institution of Technology, and the Henry Huntington Library is currently working on with a forbearing spirit, the poetics of religious toleration in revolutionary England. The article is when tolerance was no ideal. Tolerance, that often touted virtue of the enlightenment, has of late been under duress. Not only have the rhetoric and practice of intolerance suffused our political discourse in society, but the quality, character, and very constitution of tolerance have been questioned, and not just by those who oppose it. As those entrenched against the liberal project invoke bad faith arguments for free speech and their own right to be tolerated in order to justify vitriolic and sometimes violent expression of their racial, sexual, religious, and political opinions, those sympathetic to tolerance have been confronted by its shortcomings and costs. At the center of tolerance lies a conceptual problem. Tolerance excludes, even if it claims to include, accept, and approve of others. It presumes, even requires, a citizenry that is first and foremost tolerant and only secondarily wedded to beliefs and convictions, communities, and identities that might need to be tolerated. For many, such a metaphysical division is impossible, 
indeed unthinkable, by valorizing the freedom to choose, tolerance assumes its own elevation above belief and embodiment. Yet this very assumption undermines its claims to neutrality. If all are called to exercise freedom of choice, and the good life is defined primarily by such elevation, what then of those who do not or cannot see or experience the world in such terms? The secularization story is implicit in the assertions of tolerance. Since dogmatic belief is on the decline and will soon die out, so the story goes, the claims of dissenting minorities need not be taken seriously. So to find tolerance is an ideology. It is an intellectual system in which the tolerant see themselves as free agents operating in a world governed by rules that are easily apprehended Though in reality, those rules are deeply informed by their own position in the world. If tolerance is not a neutral good, not the unquestioned virtue it was once thought to be, then what course should we take in our efforts to live together across deep differences? Should we seek to reform or refashion tolerance so that it might be better equipped for our age? Or should we abandon it altogether as a passive instrument wielded by those in power to reinforce their power, insufficient to address the material disparities of our world? In response to those questions, some have proposed models based on constitutional rights. Others have advanced a politics premise on a shared experience of trauma and alienation. Some have called for new forms of dialogue. The pitch and volume of diagnoses, diagnoses and solutions seem to have increased in recent years as we try to listen through the noise and consider the best way forward. I would like to suggest that we would be well served to look again at the history of toleration in the Anglophone world and more specifically to tolerations earliest development as a concept in the 16th and 17th centuries before it became an ideal or an ideology. In taking up the example of Reformation England, I do not mean that toleration of the world should be itself our model. Rather that by studying its premises and mechanisms, and especially the emotions and behaviors associated with modes of forbearance, will be better equipped to construct, evaluate, revise, and implement our own solutions to the challenges of life in plurality. We turn now to Calvin Theological Journal. And the subject is the Beatitudes. Thankfully, we are near finishing that in a few days. More significantly, hunger and thirst show up as pairs in Matthew, again, four times in Matthew, all in one sense. In each of these, the hungry and thirsty are paired together, and the Son of Man renders judgment on whether they are filled by the merciful acts of would-be disciples. What were they filled with? something to eat and something to drink. Despite the distinct descriptions of those in the first four Beatitudes, poor in spirit, those who mourn, the lowly, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they're in the same socioeconomic group. The justice they long for is often met with practical sustenance, such as food and drink. It may well be through a welcoming hospitality or a visit in prison or when they are sick. Those hungering and thirsting for justice need mercy is further verified when we examine mercy. Aleos. Not only as noted above, does the Septuagint occasionally use Dikaiosune to translate hesed, 
uh, by far the most common word chosen to translate Hesed is Elias. When God keeps Hesed with his people, and thus also when human beings act in a similar way, the stress is not on the basic attitude, but on the manifestation in such acts. God's covenant mercy to us and our covenant mercy to others in his name are two aspects of the same thing. The covenant mercy stands at the center of the chiasm, addresses the injustice experienced by those for whom it has been elusive, and creates a manifestation of the kingdom of heaven. The disciples meet those longing for elusive justice with acts and mercy in Christ's name. There is, there is the kingdom of heaven. We will finish that in our next occasion. We'll draw this segment to a close. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Godspeed.